Hello, future graduates, families, faculty, and friends. Thank you, Dean Bronstein, for inviting me and for the kind introduction. It means a lot to me to be here today. I mean, I have this robe and it's great. <laughs> but I have so many memories from the Peabody campus. The Peabody prep is where I became a violinist. Fred just told a little bit of the first part of my story, so um, I am going to skip ahead to the fact that I've been coming to the downtown prep to study since 1985. Of course, it took some years in between, but I'm back right now, today. I was at this campus every Saturday as a kid, taking lessons, musicianship classes, and ballet. During the week, I took piano lessons. My first full violin recital took place at Leakin Hall, now known as Goodwin Hall, when I was 10. All my friends from ballet class came, and they all sat in the front row. No pressure. <laughs> it's funny to be speaking on this stage, because my strongest memory of a non-violin performance of mine is my last ballet performance about a quarter century ago on the same stage. I can't say that of any other stage in the world. A couple of years ago, I happened to be in town and saw that there was going to be an organ concert in the renovated Griswold Hall, where I used to sit in on Brelsonofsky studio master classes. I thought I would check out the space for old time's sake, so I went to that concert. At intermission, a group of students, maybe some of you, were waiting for me in the hallway. Apparently, word went out that I was in the house. I was very honored and completely surprised because when I come back to Peabody, in my mind, I'm still an eight-year-old prep kid. I learned to play ping pong here. <laughs> it's a very important musician life skill. In fact, I played so hard that I broke my tailbone diving backwards for the perfect shot. <laughs> my heart is racing. This is so exciting, but um, I'm only speaking and you're graduating. Looking at you, I'm reminded of my own graduation when I got my bachelor's degree. It was the first graduation I'd attended, and I was very busy with my own thoughts to the extent that I remember nothing of what was said in the speech. So right now, let's acknowledge what's really happening. For 10 seconds, I'll time it, I want you to say under your breath exactly what you're thinking. And I'll do it too. Let's get it all out. You have to do it. Don't leave me hanging. Okay. Let's see. Go. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> and now let's do a crescendo to get our voices working. Let's do a crescendo of speech, 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 speech. It can be anyone's speech, it doesn't have to be mine. So start quietly and wind up at your maximum and singers use your vibrato. <laughs> okay. Speech, I don't think that was your maximum. Can we just shout it one time? Like, speech! Can we do that? Okay. One, two, three. Speech! <laughs> okay. As Dr. Seuss said, fun is good. When I was thinking about what I should say today, I made a list of things that normally go into a commencement address. It's a very specific kind of speech. It's in the middle of the morning, and the audience has to sit through it. For a performer, that can be awkward. But then I kept circling back to what I wish I'd learned before I graduated, and I decided to use this time to try to help a little bit. Because really, anecdotes, which are a staple of commencement speeches, they're, they're things that happened to me once, but they're not a part of my everyday. What I really want to talk about is something that's often overlooked, but that everyone faces. It's something I've thought about a lot, 
how to connect equal and opposite experiences, problems, and solutions. If one of the few guarantees in life is that you will be surprised, then what are you going to do with the surprises? Let's do a thought experiment. Let's pretend it's tomorrow. Imagine all of your schooling is behind you. You have the tools to keep improving and to make a difference in the world. And now this is your time. There's only one thing you have to do to start this new phase of your life. Start asking yourself questions. Start with, am I content? And if the answer is no, then what am I going to do about it? If this sounds naive, why do you believe that dissatisfaction leads to great work? Or is it selfish to want to be fulfilled? Think about it this way. If your path is making you miserable, are you able to contribute fully to your field, give to the community, even just meet expectations? Music is and should be very much about serving others. We do our best for the composer, for the audience, for education. We donate our time, share our love for our art, and we try to create things of beauty for other people. This, in turn, often gives us happiness. Yet, there's annoyance in certain environments, and there are jaded musicians. That's normal. Those are human nuances. I strongly believe that it's reasonable to want to feel in some way that you're doing what you're meant to be doing. Even if that's an impossible dream, it's worth pursuing. Maybe you can make it happen outside of work, through a hobby, a second profession, or in your personal life, or within the work that you wind up doing. But you can't just will that magic to happen. Sometimes you're going to get stuck. You'll feel like you're trying to cook, you have ingredients and the name of a dish, but there's no recipe. Besides a Google search, how do you bridge the gap? I have three suggestions. One, take stock of yourself. By asking yourself open-ended questions, you can coax out some truth. There are questions like, am I content? You heard that one before. What are my strengths? Am I helping the people I want to help? Do I feel supported or torn down? It might sound wishy-washy, but the thing is, it's helpful. I started asking myself these kinds of questions after landing in a couple of situations that weren't drawing on my strengths. I don't try to answer the questions outright. It's more a matter of being aware, keeping my eyes open for opportunities, and tinkering with the details in my life that don't sit right for me. It's a little like practicing. I'm happy with the decisions I've made this way. One thing I learned is that the problem is hardly ever what you think it is at first. For example, if you someday become obsessed with curtains, it's not about the curtains. <coughs> Been there. <laughs> <laughs> Your mind creates its own metaphors. That's why you have to keep checking in with yourself, testing yourself. Two, identify your resources. In a recipe, these would be your ingredients, your cooking implements, and your heat source. In your life, your personal resources are things like time, knowledge, attitude, possessions, people, funding, creativity, and drive, and unproven potential anything you have access to. When I was figuring out which composers to commission for my 27 Encores project, my resources were my ears, the internet, recordings, tea, chocolate, and my instincts. That was probably my most homegrown project, and I'm really proud of it. 
Three, devise some small next steps across various parts of your life. And then take one of those steps and another. These should be actions you are capable of taking on your own, ideas you came up with yourself. You can take big chances, as long as those chances are rooted in good intentions. If something fails, ask yourself if you want to try again or if you should move on. Make honest efforts. Pay attention to the outcomes. And finally, if you will allow me to make one little request of every one of you sitting here today, it is to walk out into that world and show people what a strong, kind, global citizen can look like. Think about it. You are absolutely the image of now. And classic graduation line, and it's true, you are the image of the future. Let's hear it for the class of 2017.